Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We've got another great guest this week. He is the shockingly prolific chess author, as well as uh, Fide Master, um, and Danish by birth, but New Jersey resident, Karsten Hansen. Karsten, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. So, Karsten, we're... Uh I guess you could call us internet friends. We uh, correspond a bit on Twitter, and um, we're both kind of uh, actively commenting on what's going on in chess, at least when, uh, when we have the time. And I noticed that you had just come out with this new book, The Full English Opening. So I thought that, and you know, to some people's dismay, we don't talk about openings a ton on Perpetual Chess, but you've written about openings a ton, and I thought that this would be a good opportunity both to talk about your book and talk about your life and maybe touch on openings as well. So tell us about the full English opening. Why, why the English um, and why at this moment did you decide to write it? Well, uh, I mean, I've been writing a lot about the English uh, over the years. Uh, I mean, um, uh, the uh, the very first book I wrote on my own uh, was for Gambit back in um, um, it came out in uh, at the end of the, uh, the the 1990s. I had at that point uh, already written one book together with Peter Heine Nielsen, and uh, the uh, that book had been commissioned by uh, Graham Burgess, uh, who had then at that point moved on to found uh, Gambit Publications together with Maura Chandler and uh, and John Nunn. And um, I had reached out to them to see if they were interested in uh, me having uh, me writing a book for them. And um, uh, a little bit to my surprise, they said yes. Uh, so uh, I had some ideas what I would like to write about. Uh, most of them, they shut down fairly quickly. So they told me, write a list of 10 openings you would like to write about. And then the English opening, which is something I had been playing since I was a child, uh, was the uh, uh, was on that list? It was very very near the top of the list. Uh, I I picked up the English opening um, uh, back in uh, 1982 as, as as a weapon of choice, uh, completely by accident, uh, because uh, my brother had uh, had played in, in the same tournament as me. He had won a prize. I didn't win a prize. Uh, but in an earlier tournament, I had won a, a book on the 1978 uh, World Championship match between um, Karpov and Korchnoi. And uh, Korchnoi appealed to me. Uh, and he played C4 in basically every single game of that match. So I figured, you know what? If he can play it and uh, he seems like he's a cool guy, uh, maybe I should do it too. So... Uh, a couple of months after my tournament disaster there where my brother won that prize, I sat down during my summer vacation and plowed through every single game, uh, starting with 1C4 in my dad's uh, old Danish chess magazines. So um, everything from the 1950s, 1960s, and early uh, 70s, Every single game was played through. I mean, I didn't understand much of it, but I understood enough to start playing the opening. So uh, ever since then, uh, the English opening has been part of, uh, one, my repertoire, but also been like part of my identity as a chess player, because that's that's really where a lot of my understanding was founded. So uh, to get an opportunity to write a book about it, like uh, Gambit offered me, uh, was phenomenal. Uh, so first I wrote about C4, E5, and then uh, when that came out and, and did very well, um, they offered me another opportunity to write, and that was uh, on the symmetrical English. Um, and um, uh, that, that too did very well. I mean, both of them are out of print now. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, then later on, uh, Hannon Russell, he had me uh, help John Donaldson update a book uh, called The Strategic Opening Repertoire, which was a mixture of the English opening, uh, Ray T, the Catalan, and uh, setups versus uh, uh, the Queen's Indian and so forth. And there was a lot of English opening in that one as well. Um, I wrote for a short period of time on uh, chesspublishing.com on, on the English opening and flank openings. So it's been something that's been 
been uh, been by my side the entire time. And then uh, in the beginning of last year, um, I reached out to uh, um, Alad uh, Hoogland from uh, New and Chess um, because I was at that point beginning to write uh, book reviews for American Chess Magazine. And um, he suggested uh, that I perhaps should write a book for them. Uh, and then we discussed a little bit what it should be about. And I suggested maybe it could be about the English opening. I mean, I had wanted to write uh, an update on what I had done with the English opening back uh, for Gambit a long time ago. Um, but that wasn't immediately in the cart. So uh, we came up with a format that was more... Uh, explaining what the opening is all about because that was one of the things that many people had told me they really liked particularly about the first book on the English that I wrote that I discussed the ideas um, uh, told people where the pieces had to go rather than just um, provide endless amounts of opening theory so so that's uh, that. That's where the idea was was born for this this book here. It, it then turned out to be a much much bigger book than I thought it was going mm-hmm. to be originally. I mean, we had initially targeted to be uh, around three hundred twenty pages, and it ended up being uh, four hundred sixty four pages, and uh, uh, with a smaller font than usual, I think. And uh, it was just a a a really tough book to write uh, also because um, you have to condense so much knowledge and so many variations into just the pure essentials to illustrate the ideas uh, without just drowning yourself in theory because the English opening as, as, as every other opening has just gone through a ridiculous development in terms of volume of games in the in the last two uh, decades since uh, since my first books on on the opening, so there was just so many games, so many variations, and then to decide uh, which ones were important, which ones were less important, which should just be uh, dismissed quickly, or uh, said, okay, this is why it doesn't work, and what should be dived into a little bit further. That turned out to be in a, a, a massive task. So. Um, and uh, much to the frustration, of course, of uh, of the good people at uh, at uh, New and Chess, because uh, they had expected the books to be delivered a lot earlier, and I honestly also thought I would have had it ready a lot earlier. Uh, also, because I have other uh, writing obligations. Um, so, um, well, you also have I- a full time job, as we'll get to, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's uh, it's 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 not that I'm a professional chess player by right. any stretch of the imagination, or a a professional chess coach or or writer for that matter. It's uh, it is something that I had to get done in my spare in my spare time. So it 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 was a uh, it was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into that one. But I'm very happy with the uh, with the result in the end. And um, I mean. Uh, it is always uh, when it, when a new book comes out, especially uh, when it's as well taken care of as this one here, and uh, by the uh, by the editors and the publisher and so on. Uh, it, it's something that I'm immensely proud of afterwards. So. Yeah, I'm sure it's it's almost like birthing a child. I mean, you 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 have a lot of ups and downs, and it takes a long time. And uh, uh, you know, I shouldn't say birthing as a male, but um, <laughs> you know, I, who who am I to say? But yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, but you get the idea. Uh, yeah, ab- you know, absolutely. you it's something that's in your life every day for a long time. Um, there's a, there's a lot of follow up questions I have from that, Karsten. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, the first one is just as, as you probably know, as a sometime listener of the podcast, I I like to get into the nuts and bolts of uh, you know sort of how the sausage gets made. So you have the idea that you want to be published writing a chess book, and uh, so and then so you send an email to did you did you have personal contact? Um, with uh, Gambit Publishers before? Like, did you know them at all? Or yeah, did you I, just mean, send- I, I I absolutely did. I mean, uh, Graham Burgess had lived in Denmark for a while, and I think that's where the, the contact initiated uh, because he actually had reached out to uh, Peter Heine Nilsson uh, to write a book about the Accelerator track. And I mean, Peter was very, uh, I mean, he was a young, prominent, uh, enthusiastically uh, endorser of this, uh, of the Accelerator track um, uh, back in the, uh, in the, in the mid nineties. And, um, uh, but Peter, he knew himself well enough to say, you know what, uh, at this point, I don't think I'll be able to get a book uh, uh, taken care of and written uh, properly myself. So he asked me, I mean, I, uh, we've known each other since we were like, 
yeah, 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, so, and we've been traveling a bit together as well. Uh, so, uh, he asked me if I, I would like to write the, uh, the, the book with him and, uh, and especially since I'd also played the accelerated dragon. So, um, uh, so it was a good fit. I mean, and, and through that initial contact with, uh, with Gambit, sorry, with, uh, Graham Burgess in terms of getting the contract in place and so forth. Um, I worked with him on, on that part of it, but again, uh, Graham had lived in Denmark. We had played several times. Uh, he's a super sympathetic guy and, uh, we were getting along, so uh, 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 usually I beat him uh, but <laughs> when we were playing against each other. But again, he, he's very knowledgeable and a very good uh, editor and writer in his own right. Um, so um, so it, it was a natural choice for me to try to reach out to them rather than Batsford, uh, who at that point, or um, Batsford, they had severe financial troubles at that time, so... So it wouldn't be a natural fit for me to try to continue to write for Batsford. So, uh, so uh, therefore, um, to get in touch with uh, Graham was my natural choice. Um, and, and then getting to work with Murray Chandler and John Nunn in the process was just like, uh, uh, seriously, uh, something that I really, really appreciated. I mean, um, to, to write a, a manuscript uh, to someone like John uh, and then send it to, to the team there and then have John Nunn's comments on uh, on the manuscript and saying, I would like to do this differently and, the, yeah. and then just relating a funny story in the notes and stuff like that, uh, that was just mind-blowing for someone like me. I mean, John Nunn was probably, um, without a doubt, the premier writer, uh, chess, uh, chess author at the time, so... Yeah, he's a legend. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I would, I would so, be quite intimidated. <laughs> and and trust me, so was I. I mean, uh, and especially because when I wrote my first book for them, I didn't have a regular chess database. I mean, uh, my computer didn't run very well with the NIC database that I had at the time, the New and Chess Database program. Uh, and uh, I, there was no proper chess engine that worked for me. So I had to analyze everything. So when they pointed out an an analytical error or something like that, I had to sit down with my chessboard and work through all the variations myself. Uh, so and then have to present my analysis back to them. So that was incredibly intimidating. But also, um, I learned a lot from that, um, and uh, I will always be appreciative of uh, of working with that team. I mean, very smart guys. Uh, uh, and tough business guys as well. So, okay. yeah, so absolutely. So, um, you've and obviously you've written. I, I started counting on Amazon, and I think I got to at least twenty five. So you've written just uh, an incredible number of books since then. So yes. just just to get a little more detail, and you can reveal as much or as little as you want. Yeah. But when you when you uh, correspond with publishers about coming out with a chess book, uh, like is there like a standard deal that they offer you, and is there a lot of back and forth about like you know, if there's any, um, what's it called? The, uh, upfront, <laughs> the upfront money. I'm sorry. I'm drawing a blank. Um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, uh I mean, uh, the adva- advanced, advance, that's yes, it. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> no, absolutely. There, there is some conversation. I mean, uh, many of the publishers, they have sort of a standard setup, but again, uh, it, it's different from, from person to person because I mean, uh, I'm a feeder master. Uh, of course there are uh, a couple of titles that are above, uh, my, my pay grade, so to speak. Um, uh, both international masters, grandmasters, and then the, the world-class grandmasters. And I'm sure their advances are different from mine. Right. But uh, again, uh, I don't think there's an unlimited amount of money that there's, uh, in, uh, chess publishing. So they can't just hand over huge sums of money. Uh, and again, they, they, the publishers, they have to earn in their money first uh, before you get any additional money. So, I mean, there there are contracts where you get a flat fee payment, um, and then there's royalty-based. Uh, and each publisher, they construct it differently. So, um, uh, there's um, uh, many discussions about small details, and uh, especially now with the... Uh, chess publishing world uh, changing more and more. There are more publishers coming out. There are people publishing their own books, such as what I have been doing myself as well. Uh, so the the market is a little bit more muddled than it used to be. I mean, it used to be just uh, the big uh, publishers like uh, uh, Batsford, 
every man that has uh, that's gone through several uh, renditions. I mean, they were Pergamon and uh, a few other names uh, in between. I can't remember them all, but uh, uh, there's been. Uh, and then, yes, uh, of course, there's been the German publishers, and then uh, some of the bigger publishing houses as well. Um, uh, that is not the same anymore. I mean, there are many smaller publishers, uh, Metropolitan, Russell Enterprises, there's Thinkers Publishing that's very ambitious. Um, uh, there's Chess Evolution, uh, Quality Chess, uh, and I could go on and on and on. McFarland has, uh, of course, um, put out these uh, almost library books that, uh, in terms of scholarship and uh, the, the scholarly work that's gone into it. So it, it's... Uh, th- there are so many players in the market right now here, and uh, I mean anybody can really write a chess book. Uh, the question is, uh, do you have the ability to write it yourself, or do you need uh, somebody to steer your way, like uh, through the the setup of a traditional publisher? Right. Which for new authors, they probably it's probably the latter. But for someone like you, you could go either way at this point. Yeah, and again, for for uh, for, for newer pub, uh, writers, it's difficult to get a contract with a traditional publisher because uh, you are an, an unknown. So unless you have an amazing idea or are very uh, are a very good writer, uh, have have a good name as ter- in terms of having written uh, articles for magazines and so forth, um, then it's going to be difficult to break through to these uh, these. Uh, uh, these traditional publishers, but again, it, it does happen all, from time to time. I mean, uh, I remember when I was uh, reviewing books for uh, for a Chess Cafe, and there was uh, this article uh, by uh, Michael De La Mesa uh, on uh, rapid chess improvement. And I, I thought it was a fun article. I wrote to him that I really enjoyed it, and uh, uh, then he said, "I would like to have it published as a book." Uh, and I said, yeah, well, here are some contacts. Try and reach out to them. Explain to them what you want to do and so on. And then try to work a little bit more into the details. And then the uh, the book emerged and it became a huge success. Uh, um, I, and and that's how many of the smaller writers break through. They They have a good idea. They are able to sell it to a publisher, and then it gets published. I mean, not every idea works, not even if you've convinced a, a big publisher, but um, that's just the nature of, uh, of of writing. I mean, not everything becomes a success. Yeah, from the outside looking in, I, w- I mean, sort of from the outside looking in, I'm in the chess world, but yeah. not being a, a chess writer, um, my perspective is that maybe the – the upside of chess books is probably lower than, say, you, you know, if you're writing a novel or a nonfiction book or something like that. But I, it does seem like the, the the odds of success are at least higher than they are of just writing a random book. I mean, you know, the success is defined a bit differently. But I mean, I think you can break through as a new author and have thing have something that resonates people and that you know. Uh, reward you for your effort, uh, both in you know some financial remuneration, but also in terms of uh, getting your name out there, and it makes the publisher's efforts worth it as well. Oh, absolutely! I mean, uh, that is definitely possible, and it it, it it's also def- uh, possible to make yourself a, a well-known name through uh, self-publications and and writings and so on. And I mean, with the internet as it is today, I mean, you can become fairly big. Uh, uh, without the same kind of effort you had to put in earlier. But again, it's uh, uh, just because you get a book out there doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be be making the same amount of money as Stephen King. Right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, many of my friends, they have asked me, it's like, yeah, so, so how many copies have you sold? And I'm like, uh, yeah, uh, I, <laughs> it's not that many. I mean, I, I, I think uh, if, if uh, Stephen King sold and, and just – pre-orders as little as I have sold for all my books combined, he would be terribly disappointed. Uh, (laughs) But at the same time, I mean, the chess market is a lot smaller uh, publishing-wise than it is for, like, to say, romance, for example. Uh, I mean, I wish that I could uh, sell as many uh, copies of my books as uh, as some of uh, of the people that I know that write in other uh, in, in other subjects and or in other types of books, like in fiction and so on, that are doing really well. But uh, that's just the nature of uh, of of our our subject here with chess. Here, I mean, it it is fairly small and there is a lot of 
books that are just being distributed through PDF copies uh, for no money at all that I, I would never see a penny of, of course. Yeah, people don't do that. That's, you know, these, <laughs> these people work very hard. It's not, you know, just pay, pay the 20 bucks or whatever and be done with it. Um, a- since we're still on the topic of uh, the book publishing business, I might as well ask you this question now yeah. that uh, Elon Rubin, the publisher of uh, Elk and Ruby, weighed in with on the uh, Facebook chess book collectors thread. Um, about uh, the full English opening, but I mean the the thread was about that. But the question yeah. is, please ask Karsten how he sees the role of print on demand in chess publishing in the long term. Oh, and which is his favorite Sasanko book? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, but we'll start with print on demand. Yes. No. Exactly. I mean, print on demand is. Uh, I mean, th- there there's the traditional way of doing it, uh, where you go into a, a vanity publisher, they they print the book for you, and then uh, you try to sell it yourself. Uh, that sucks uh, because you have no distribution network. You are uh, in a, in a terrible situation. Uh, you're, you're sitting with two thousand copies of your book in in your own garage. Then there is the setup that uh, Amazon has made very popular through their KDP publishing uh, surface, and I, that's the one I've been, uh, I've been been using myself. There are several others: uh, Ingram Spark, uh, CreateSpace, Lulu.com, and a couple of other places. Uh, where they're offering quality products, where you can sell them through, um, uh, I mean, known surfaces like uh, like Amazon's own uh, uh, website in every country in the world. I mean, you can both sell them as ebooks and also print on demand. Uh, their print on demand is not available in every country, though. So that's, for example, is only United States, UK, Germany. Uh, France, Spain, Italy, Japan, and hmm. I think that's about it. I mean, even though Amazon is in other countries, they only offer it in those places. However, uh, Amazon uh, and CreateSpace and Ingram Spark in particular, they have very good setups where you can order the books and sell from there as well. So, for example, um, before you were not able to get your book uh, on uh, the surfaces of uh, websites of like Barnes and Noble and and, um, and 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 other major retailers that you can do now through these uh, these setups there yeah. um, and also um, because there's a good distribution setup uh, I, I for example I'm able to sell books to to chess and bridge in London uh, to new and chess to to Nickerman in uh, in Germany and, and and other retailers around the world um, because Amazon they, they they sent these books here anywhere so I I can have my books now be in the stores of traditional chess uh, chess resellers and uh, that is a phenomenal thing that you were never able to do before because you didn't have the distribution that now is possible for just about anybody provided of course you write a decent book and you can convince these stores to carry your books for you so um uh, and uh, i mean i think uh, that's going to be a major competition to the traditional publishers mm-hmm. uh, provided that a you write decent books and b you get them edited properly And uh, you get a good cover for your books as well, because, I mean, uh, some of the self-published books in the past were absolutely hideous. I mean, in terms of uh, editing and, uh, uh, and, I mean, particularly the covers. I mean, uh, everybody think they have sort of an artist inside themselves and they know what a cover is supposed to look like. But trust me, I tried it myself (laughs) for (laughs) for my... uh, for the very first uh, volume in in, uh, in my catastrophes and tactics series, and um, it didn't sell at all to begin with. I mean, uh, so I had somebody look at my content, and they're like, "You need to do some editing here, and uh, make it stronger there, and make something clearer." And then um, I think it was my brother that told me, "You need to do something with the cover. It it looks nice, but it looks like you did it yourself." Mm-hmm. Uh, so I I had to hire a a a, 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 a designer and uh, he's the one that came up with the uh, 
the current uh, version of it, and I mean, it, it looks a lot better uh, based on my idea, but it looks a lot stronger and sharper compared to what it did initially. So, uh, uh, so I mean, anybody can do it, but you have to be realistic also. You, uh, do you have a book in you? Do you know how to uh, construct it? And uh, make sure you have somebody to read it as well before you put it out there, because, uh, I mean... Uh, just because you think you can write English or talk speak English doesn't mean necessarily that you're a good writer. Yeah, and in the the chess world in particular, it's so niche that like you know a lot of people with a first time book might have their wife or their mom read it or something like that. But uh, you probably need a <laughs> need a chess player. It, exactly, and not only that, but also you need someone who's speaking English natively if you if you want to publish in English. And and I mean. I have seen books, and I mean, it even happened in the old days when uh, when the Russian uh, books were translated into English. I mean, some of them, uh, some of the translations were awful, and the uh, English in the books were, I mean, decidedly not correct English. I mean, I, my English is not perfect either. I've been <laughs> speaking it as my first language for over 20 years, but it's far from perfect. And well, my, mine either. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, if, if English is only your second or third language, I mean, you really need someone to look it over before you put it in print. So. Yeah. So, okay. So we still got, I mean, we've got so much to talk about, but <laughs> I mean, so you've, you've been churning out books ever since uh, you, you wrote your first book, as you told the story of. So what, and you work full time. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit, but why don't you tell us what your work schedule is like? Like, are you just writing when you get home every night or how do you manage to find the time to, um, to write so many chess books while still working? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I mean, for I, I actually took several breaks in between um, uh, between writing, and, and for for a few years, I, I barely wrote anything. Then um, uh, I I had an idea for a book that I wanted to write for myself, um, and uh, then I said, you know what, this uh, and that's what became this uh, series, the catastrophes and tactics. I thought on, or, originally it was just supposed to be one volume, so I started working on it, and I'm like. This is going to be an 800-page book easily if, if I just <laughs> write it in one go. That's going to be hopeless, and, and I'll never finish it because I know myself well enough. If I have such a massive task, then I will never finish it. So uh, what I have done to start writing more structured uh, and more productively uh, is to uh, – first thing in the morning when I get up, I – and then I try to get up at 5, 5.30, and then I write for a bit before I have to go to work. Uh, and then uh, in the evenings after uh, dinner, I try to write some more. Uh, I have come to realize that my writing in the e evenings is not as strong as it is in the morning. I get a lot more done in the morning when, when my head is clear and I'm energetic and full of ideas than I get in the evening when I'm tired. So... So I try to get a, as many hours in in the morning before uh, I have to go to work. Uh, and um, it's it's remarkable how much you can get done if you get yourself structured properly. And I think that's uh, I think that's where most um, authors they they get themselves uh, in in a bit of a pickle because they they don't outline their material uh, properly. Um, they just write in a in a particular order of the book and then they never finish uh, or they take much too long uh, of course it has happened to me many times as several of my publishers in the past will testify to that uh, because you procrastinate you write what you think is fun and then you left the, leave the really really difficult parts uh, to the end but uh, if you have a good outline and uh, uh, and you know where you're going. Uh, you can write a lot faster than if you're just doing it haphazardly and in uh, whichever order you think uh, is the most fun. Uh, and uh, that is something I learned uh, only uh, really last year. Uh, and that's when uh, my my writing uh, writing speed really uh, uh, took off. Uh, I mean, I. And then, of course, I mean, uh, some of the books I, I've I've had a little bit of help with uh, people that have helped me uh, uh, locate some of the material and so on. But the writing part, uh, I'd had to do myself. So uh, as much as it sucks sometimes, uh, um, it, 
you have to be creative. You have to write uh, in a varied fashion because otherwise the reader will be bored uh, and find what you're doing uninteresting. Yeah, um, and I I did read the introduction to your book, and it was definitely well written, and it made me want to read more. I'm not I'm not an English player, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I, I haven't yet. But I mean, I, I can tell that uh, that your work uh, paid off. And <laughs> so you. so when you when you're working on the book, um, I mean, obviously writing opening books, there's got to be a lot of sort of interfacing with computers. So how does it work? How do you balance like? going from prose to the computer and looking up lines uh, on databases and stuff like that. And do you find yourself going down sort of rabbit holes where you're not writing and just sort of going through some grandmaster game? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it does happen. Um, but again, if, if you know where you're going to begin with, and that, uh, I mean, again, if, if you start by outlining carefully to begin with, and that, that's what I have made myself in the habit of. I mean, uh, if, if I know approximately this is what the chapter is supposed to be here. This is how I should weigh the different parts in this chapter. Then, uh, for example, with my book here on the English opening here, uh, I know, okay, uh, this particular chapter here is on, let's just say, four nights uh, without G3. So I know that, of course, there's uh, E3, uh, D3, A3, uh, and D4 are, are the principal lines. And then E4 as well, you can, you can, uh, uh, those lines have to be covered. So then I know, okay, e, the E3 line is more important than the others because there are more games in that. So I have to figure out, okay, which are the, the main lines that need to be covered here? And then I sort of try to limit myself to the most important games, I try to focus on the most recent ones with the strongest possible players while keeping a keen eye on what is the most instructive variations. Because, I mean, sometimes, uh, as fashion will have it, uh, all of a sudden, uh, stronger players, they will start playing a certain line against each other repeatedly. And that's not necessarily the variation that makes the most sense for uh, my target audience. And I mean, I have to keep that in mind when I'm looking at it. I'm like, as much fun as it can be to dive into like the minutia of a, of a particular line of the hedgehog uh, in the symmetrical English, that's not what most people will see uh, when they're playing uh, the, the English opening themselves. Um, as much as people, they think they study opening theory and so on, it's not the lines that they're more likely to see. They, they, uh, so I, I try to give a broad coverage and saying, all right, this is a natural move that you will not necessarily see frequently in Grandmaster Chess, but it's something you will frequently encounter in uh, for my target audience. And yeah. Then, and then, of course, uh, from that point onwards, uh, I'm like, uh, I, I, I have the main games. I fill in the games that I think should be in the nodes. I structure the uh, the main game. And then uh, then once I have done that for every, every main game in the chapter, that's when I start writing uh, and putting the pros in at the end. And what about like general... Uh, avoiding procrastination like do you do you check your email when you're writing i'm just always curious how people manage like for someone to work full-time and be able to to put out so much uh so much good content i'm just curious if you have like demons that you battle or if you've been oh, able to develop a system absolutely and that that's that, especially when i'm writing in the evening i'm very easily distracted and right. then, uh, yeah. i mean I've, I've had to switch off my notifications of uh, every social media i put my phone away uh, and then i have one uh, i mean i work with two computer screens one is uh what it's going to look like in the book and the other one is my database and then I'm writing away. Uh, and then I just uh, try to focus on it. However, when I'm tired and when I, uh, that's when I get distracted. And then I go in and surf a little bit on, uh, on Twitter and, and Facebook and whatever and, and see the updates from various chess websites. And then all of a sudden I end up sitting and analyzing a dumb game that I shouldn't do. Yeah, well, spe <laughs> speaking of which, that's one question that I, a burning question for me is I've seen you mention on Twitter that you, you go through all the games of the week in chess. Is, no, is this true? I, I, I don't go through all the games, uh, but I go through the ones that make sense for me. Uh, so um, I uh, typically the openings that are part of my opening repertoire and the ones that I have written about, I go in and 
skim them. Uh, like, uh, to see if there's anything of relevance uh, to me, if there's any important novelties, uh, if if there's, it seems like an, an interesting idea that's popped up. Uh, and it doesn't really matter if it's a short or a long game in those uh, variations I play myself. I, I, I go through it quickly, and then I'm like, okay, all right, that's interesting. And then I save it into a file uh, with that particular variation. Yeah. Then, of course, then uh, because I've been writing a lot about miniatures lately uh, and chess tactics, um, I have a, uh, several folders for that. Uh, so, for example, uh, my, my series on the catastrophes and tactics, those are games of 15 moves or fewer. So I have a folder for those as well. I play through all of them to see if it's just a, a blunder that decides the game or if it's an interesting piece of tactics that, uh, I mean a strong play overlooked because then it could be worthwhile both as a tactical exercise but also into a, a future book for example and the same thing for miniatures i mean i, I think there's an incredible amount of interesting uh, instructive material in um, in these games uh, that are uh, 25 moves or less uh, if if the players are strong enough i mean because otherwise if 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 the rating drops too far down it tends to be like repeated bad moves or um uh, or just a, a, a completely misunderstanding of the idea of the opening and then people they um, they kill themselves on the sword very quickly mm-hmm. whereas stronger players there is something deeper underneath that goes com- completely wrong in a game and that is instructive to me and uh, i think that'll be instructive to most players because they can learn from something that went went terribly bad for a strong player um and uh, those i always play through and um i mean that, that it varies from uh, from download to download and the the twig downloads but uh, there's typically uh, between 20 and 70 games that that I will just quickly browse through to see if there's anything interesting in. Uh, but by no means do I go through the entire file. That is okay. possible. I mean, last week, or actually this week, it was over 7,000 games. There's no way I would have to. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I, I was, to uh, all of those. Yeah. <laughs> so, that, that's a minor relief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, no. Yeah. Okay. So we have a, a related a uh, question from Jay Stallings, a uh, friend of the podcast and friend of yours and mine. Yes. Uh, he asks, uh, hi, Karsten. When GM John Gustafson made his first appearance on Perpetual Chess, he basically said that if he gets nothing from the opening, he's not really interested in the game anymore. Are you an opening and aficionado to that degree, or do you love all stages and aspects of the games? In other words, are you, after the opening, are you just as determined to create amazing moves? I, I would say I used to be like him. I, and I mean, uh, and one of my friends when I was a, a junior player, he compared me to Mike Tyson. And he's like, I was extremely well armed to begin with, and it would be all punches. And if they could get me out of the opening in decent shape, then we would have a real game. Uh, now I I actually appreciate chess a lot more uh, for for the beauty of what can happen later on. Um, uh, I love studying uh, end games, which is something I hated when I was younger, uh, and and just the uh, the interesting ideas that can arise in a completely boring uh, middle game position that fascinates me endlessly. So um, so yeah, I mean uh, I I I have to disagree with Gustafsson on that. I mean it, it's there's so much more to chess than just the opening phase, and I think. Uh, what Portis he wrote in uh, in the book How to Open a Chess Game that the that the uh, purpose of the opening is to get a playable position that's uh, uh, far more important than uh, necessarily having an advantage after the opening and, and a playable position is not just uh, something that is playable for anybody but it's something that you understand mm-hmm. uh, uh, and and understand well and I mean that's that's why I try to teach my students that. It doesn't really matter what other people they think about this position here. If you are comfortable in it, and if you know the plans, the typical tactical ideas, the typical strategies, then you are far better armed than somebody who has plowed through uh, the latest volume of, let's just say, Bologan's, uh, uh, let's just say, uh, Bologan's Black Weapons, uh, which is like a monster of a book compared to mine on the English, but where he goes really deep into the theory and so on uh but where 
many players they will be left stranded in the final positions of a variation, even though there's an assessment, they have no idea what to do with it. Um, and uh, I think uh, if if you know what to do with your positions, uh, that that makes it so much more interesting. And I mean that that has really been my goal ever since I saw that comment. And that's actually John Donaldson that wrote it in the foreword to um, uh, a strategic opening or repertoire. And that was the first time I saw it. And I'm like, that's really clever words. Uh, yeah, and that, that's that, a, it's an important point. <laughs> it, it is. And, and I mean, that's been sort of my guiding light since because I, I used to be, uh, I mean, spending a lot of time on studying openings and studying opening tactics and uh, and just try to memorize everything. I mean, the dragon variation was my baby for uh, a long, long time, and I knew every single move that happened and every bit of development. I would know it. Uh, I, I, I had it down, had it analyzed, and so on. But that's not the, really the point of the opening for me anymore. It's just mm. to get a, a position, and I really enjoy actually uh, playing against players and like telling me afterwards. But I'm supposed to be better, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe you are, but I mean, clearly you didn't understand what to do with your position. Uh, and I mean, that's, that's, uh, I, I have a fewer uh, that a fewer things that um, that I enjoy more than than sitting and discussing that with an opponent afterwards uh, that they didn't know what to do with their position. Yeah, and and I do just want to stress, like particularly, I would say, say eighteen hundred or under. I mean, if. If you're not playing the French because like it's not popular at the 2700 level right now, like that's yeah. that's not how you should be selecting your openings. I mean, no. it, if it, if something makes you comfortable and if you know the, and like you say, knowing the ideas is the most important thing. Yeah. Just uh, feel, feeling like you have a plan and you you know where to, your pieces go. Yeah, no, I um, mean Albert, he he actually stressed that also in one of his books where he um he said that uh, he had played. Uh, I think the Alekhine against Karpov and got in a worse position and it uh, made him basically give up the opening at one point. Um, but again, not everybody plays like Karpov, thankfully. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so even though Karpov can get an advantage and know what to do with the advantage and, and eventually take it to a full point, uh, that doesn't mean that everybody else will be able to do it. And if you understand the opening better um, than your opponent, I mean, there's no reason why you shouldn't be playing a so-called inferior opening or an opening that is that is not popular at top level. In fact, I mean, uh, there, there's no reason to play the variations that are uh, that are, are popular at top level at any given time. I mean, you shouldn't be going for for the fashionable variations. It, it's a total waste of time. Yeah, and uh, if it's obscure enough, what you're playing, it can actually work to your advantage because completely. exactly your, your opponent might probably doesn't know it if you're the only one playing it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, do you get a chance to play much? Like, do you do you play in tournaments? Do you play blitz online or? I, I play a bit of Blitz online. I, I want to play more tournaments, and I haven't uh, honestly played seriously for almost a decade. Uh, I, a, since I moved to New Jersey, which should be the place where I could, I mean, because I live close to New York City as well, there's so many tournaments all the time, yet I n- almost never play over the board. And uh, that that pains me, because I, I really enjoy that facet of, of, of the game. But um, And that's something that I'm going to be trying to change. Um, but uh, I do play online, and I do yeah. play some Blitz. Um, well, waking I, up at 5.30 a.m. to work, and then, <laughs> exactly. and then working, and then writing again. I would say you have a decent excuse. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> So, right. um, but I, I play on several uh, platforms, um, but uh, and and each platform has uh, has their their things that are good about them. But uh, right now, I'm enjoying play on uh, playing on uh, Li Chess. Okay, yeah, Li Chess is great. I yeah, I wish that I were more of an opening aficionado. You know, like as you were saying, vis a vis Jay's question, and and what what Jan Gustafsson had said was. The openings are are his favorite phase and of the game. So for him, that's what interesting. What's interesting, but his general advice is that you should study what interests you, because yeah. like you know, probably if you're asking like uh, you know, Jan gets asked all the time how to get better at chess. Probably if you're asking a grandmaster in a chat box how you could get better at chess, you know, you're not Magnus Carlsen. Like you're no. <laughs> you're, not, you're not a professional. So you're trying to get you know you you're doing it for enjoyment so you should yeah. do what you enjoy and me personally i like openings but 
for me there it's kind of such a ti- such a tire fire right now my opening repertoire that i just kind of ignore it so but i think that if my openings were sharper that would make blitz more enjoyable for me because like whatever the result is then like you can you can uh you can learn one move more in the opening and uh you know from there sharpen your repertoire more and more um as uh, Andres Krizdwa, when he came on and talked about um, his improvement methods, Blitz is a great way for learning openings more than anything else. It, it is. It is. I mean, I, I have to say that at, actually at one point when I was playing on the uh, chess base platform uh, uh, quite a lot, uh, I actually had two personas. One where I played absolutely ridiculously sharp uh, crazy openings, and then I would be there's my other normal persona where I would be playing more pos- positional and uh, measured uh, chess that uh, more similar to what I am as a normal chess player. But uh, the funny thing is, my wild rating uh, when I was playing the wild openings and the very obscure variations of some random Sicilian and so on was actually higher than it was on on my my normal one i mean i think i was over 2600 at one point with my my crazy repertoire uh where i would be playing like a knight c3 or uh a sicilian with c5 and b6 before doing anything else and just uh, throwing my pawns forward and so on so i, I again it, it it's it's a good way of of sharpening your game as well i mean I, I try to be more fearless um, because that way you also test yourself a little bit more instead of just being comfortable. Yeah, that sounds like a fun experiment. <laughs> it, it, it was. I mean, I enjoyed it, and uh, uh, it was fun to have. At that point, I think I had uh, two of my ratings were in, uh, I think, top 150 on uh, the uh, chess base uh, surface. But again, it's uh, a lot has changed since then. Let's <laughs> just say that way. Yeah. <laughs> I don't belong there anymore. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll rise again. Oh, well, um, let's see. Let's see. So, so Karsten, you know we need to, to talk about chess improvement, So, yeah. and we need to get some book recommendations. And obviously, you're extremely well qualified on uh, on the latter topic in particular, having been reviewed many books and written, you know, h- however many. Do you do you even have the count of how many you've you've published? Uh, well, I I've, uh, I think I have twenty six books. Twenty six. Yes. Wow. And uh, I mean, one of them was uh, exclusively an ebook that I did for Chess Cafe, but uh, in, in printed books is uh, is um, twenty five now. Uh, but uh, more on the way, uh, and 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 very soon around the corner as well. Amazing! So. Do you want to tease what your next one is, or do you want to uh, keep it under wraps for now? <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm uh, desperately trying to finish a book right now for Every Man Chess on the uh, Bishop B5 Sicilian. There, so that's both the uh, Rosalimo attack against the Sicilian and the Moscow attack. Um, so uh, I'm trying to finish that right now. So, okay, uh, and. Uh, uh, again, that's one of those that's, that I should have had finished, but uh, has uh, been paining me through uh, through the spring here with uh, with uh, a lot of other things going on. So uh, I'm I'm looking forward to having that finished and and hopefully people enjoying that one as well. But uh, that, the the thing is, at any given time when I'm writing. I have ideas for another 25 books that wow. that I have like already uh, sort of uh, outlined and uh, uh, sort of working on the ideas. So uh, so whenever I see something that could be used for a particular book, then I throw it into the file. Um, so and I, in, in those 25 books, there's a biography. There's a um, some on historical chess uh, tournaments um, and uh, some other game collections and uh, tactics collections and so on. So there's a bunch of stuffs going on. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I have to do one thing at a time, unfortunately. Yeah, but, never... <laughs> but but not just opening books by any stretch. No, 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 absolutely. Because I mean, it, it, chess is so much more than just openings. And I mean, while I've been writing more about openings than I have about anything else, uh, uh, it's it's easy to write about openings, uh, but uh, I mean I I would like to develop myself as a writer as well and and get better at at all phases of of writing about stuff. I mean that's that's why for example my book uh, Improve Your Positional Chess is probably one of the books that I have learned the most from writing um, because uh, all of a sudden the ideas I had in my head and how I understood chess all of a sudden I had to explain it in writing. So other people would understand how I was looking at a position. 
and uh, and benefit from my ideas and and you can't just do that haphazardly uh, and i think that's possibly why also the book has done uh, done reasonably well i mean it's been translated both to spanish and russian um I think it's because I'm I'm good at relaying those ideas. I mean, and it it took a lot of uh, a lot of effort, but I learned a lot from it too. And I think uh, the general feedback when it came out was also that uh, that even really strong players they felt they learned from from reading the book. And uh, where and and I mean, players that were rated 1700, they said, okay, well, this this opened a door to something else for them. So. Um, so I think that's that's also where I I learn uh, more about chess myself by writing about something that I'm not uh, necessarily amazing at uh, that is not easy but more like right at the outside of where I'm comfortable. Yeah, uh, yeah, it gives you a chance to flesh out your ideas. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so what are your favorite chess books? Um, I have several. Um, uh, one of my uh, the first book that I learned a lot from was uh, uh, Nimsovich's My System. I, I picked it up at a flea market uh, in my in the local town I grew up in. Uh, my dad didn't have it. My dad is a chess player himself, but he didn't have it. I picked it up. Uh, I felt I'll, all of a sudden I, I knew more. Uh, not necessarily I didn't have any clear uh, idea about everything, but I, I think I picked up a lot. Then uh, Oiver and Kramer, uh, they wrote this series of uh, middle game books uh, in the 60s, and uh, that was the next stepping stone for me. They they broke up the middle game in all these different phases uh, and different aspects of the game, and I really learned a lot from that. Then... Of course, Ben Larson's book. Uh, being a Dane, uh, I've been reading have been Larson's book since. Yeah, basically, I started playing chess. So, uh, the first one was uh, the opening play in chess. Um, uh, the edition I had was from 1965. He had a little theoretical section at the back. That was the, basically the foundation of my opening repertoire uh, for the first several years of my my chess playing career. Um, and then, of course, his uh, his uh, selected games, uh, his fifty selected games, that has been published many, many times over in in various editions by all sorts of publishers all over the world. That book uh, was just phenomenal uh, in in building my understanding on chess and also uh, how to fight um, as a chess player. Um, then. Um, uh, John Nunn's books, uh, one that I enjoyed a lot, and I think still uh, is is a classic, is uh, uh, Secrets of Practical Chess. Um, it's it's a little book. Uh, I think it may have been an, uh, that uh, may be a new edition of it uh, called something slightly different, but uh, that's where uh, he introduced that concept: uh, loose pieces drop off. Oh uh, yeah, many other things. Uh, uh, that is a, a phenomenal book. Another formative book for me was uh, Chess for Tigers by Simon Webb, um, an English international master. Yeah, that's kind of a cult classic. It, it uh, is. And, and honestly, uh, uh, it, it taught me a lot about practical chess as well. Uh, and uh, I had em- I've had employed a lot of the ideas over the years. Um, and I think it's, uh, I still think it's a phenomenal book. I mean, not all of the ideas are still uh, user-friendly, but... Um, I, I have employed many of the ideas over the years. Um, then there was an, uh, a book that I was actually given to me by a student because I, I had, when I lived in England, I felt my game had plateaued a bit. I didn't enjoy particularly uh, uh, when playing. Uh, I didn't do well. I was stuck. And then uh, one of my students, he gave me a Druretsky book. Uh, and of course, a lot of people love Druretsky's books, but to me, it, it taught me basically a new way of how the pieces were moving <laughs> it's it, it's called training for the tournament player and and that opened my eyes to chess again and uh, really made me enjoy chess because i saw possibilities at a chess board that i'd never seen before uh, it also taught me uh, the value of analyzing my games carefully uh, which is something that i had been terribly poor at um I was good at just going over the games afterwards and uh, 
and I think that's what most people do. Then they enter it in their database when they come home, and then they have the computer analyze it. But that's not how you get good. Uh, if you want to get good at chess, you need to analyze your games very carefully uh, and figure out where you make mistakes and why you make mistakes. Why did I make that particular mistake at that point? Uh, why did I think for 20 minutes in this particular position? Right, yeah. What was I thinking about? Uh, what was it I couldn't decide on? What, couldn't I find the idea, uh, the right idea, the strategical concept that I needed to move forward with? Was it a tactic that I couldn't calculate properly? Because unless you do that exercise, you won't know your true weaknesses, and you don't know uh, where the critical points are in the game, where things are changing for you, where the flow changes from you feeling like you're doing well, and all of a sudden the opponent takes over. Why did he take over? Uh, if you don't go into that carefully, uh, that's, uh, that's why you don't get better. And uh, typically, that's where I lose my students when when I start asking them to do that. <laughs> yeah, because uh, they they like to be told what they need to do, um, and then go home and do everything on the computer. Uh, but that's not how you work during a chess game. You don't have a computer you can just switch on and find the perfect uh, tactic uh, tactical opportunity or find uh, this amazing uh, defense. I mean. Uh, uh, I, put, I participated in this training camp when I was a, a junior player where uh, we were each assigned to a um, one of the best Danish chess players. And I was assigned Kurt Hansen, who was a top 20 player in the world at the time. And I had to analyze all my games from the, the tournament that I had just finished. There was nine rounds, and I had to analyze it in detail. And, of course, at that time, there were no computers. Um and then uh, at one point, he, uh, I had declined a pawn sacrifice because it looked too dangerous. And I, I wrote that in my notes to the game, and he's like, that's a good, uh, good observation to make. But here afterwards, you absolutely must analyze it to figure out if you made the right decision. So I had to do it. I hated every second of it, <laughs> of course. Uh, moving forward, I didn't do that. I, uh, I I totally did not do that with any of my games for years. Um, so that's why I plateaued. And that's why most people, they plateau, because they don't take the necessary steps to find out where they make the mistakes and why they make the mistakes. Yeah. And, and I mean, even uh, Spassky said at one point that Fisher, that his only weak point was that he didn't sense where the critical turning point in the games were. And that's an interesting observation, but I think that goes for most chess players. Uh, they don't realize when the game changes and why it changes and can then start taking measures before it happens. Right. Uh, and I think that's where most people, they can improve their game very easily if they just start working on that by analyzing their own games without a computer when they get home. And then they, afterwards, they can, of course, check their analysis with a computer and figure out, okay, this is everything that I've done wrong. I misunderstood this position. In this position where I thought I was clearly better, the computer says I could win a rook. But that, that's besides the point. That, that's, that's where you get strong, by starting to work that through. Because at the game, you don't have a computer to help you. So, uh, so uh, that is more important than anything else <laughs> in, in chess. If, if you want to get good, analyze your games and analyze them carefully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because when you play a game, basically what you're doing in addition to analyzing is you're constructing a narrative of 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 what's happening in the game as it goes. Mm -hmm. Um Absolutely. and that that governs so much of your decisions what the narrative is and I mean I've certainly had games where I thought I was doing better and then you look at the game and it's like, "Oh, I was never better." Yeah. You know, or or the or the opposite. And so much of uh how you perceive how you're doing in a given position uh sort of you know, if you think you're doing well, you might play too confidently and play too quickly. Um, if you think you're doing poorly, you might burn up all your time. And and like you say, like the the deconstructing of the thought process is where you really 
you really can improve your play. Not that I'm doing it, mind you, but no, most people, <laughs> most, most people aren't. I mean, yeah. I, and and that, that's where most people they stop their progress. I mean, that by not analyzing their games uh, afterwards. And I mean, that's something I have changed since, but uh, it took me many years to realize just how awful I've been doing it <laughs> and, right. and my, uh, uh, treating my own game. And, and, and that is really uh, where, I mean, that's my advice to any chess player. Analyze your games, do it carefully, do it without a computer, and then once you think you have figured everything out, that's when you switch the computer on. Yeah. Uh, but uh, again, it's it's tough. I mean, again, uh, where I learned the most about chess uh, in terms of writing about it, that's when I had to write uh, a the book about positional chess, but also when I had to write about the Nimsu Indian with four e three, because the computer was completely useless when I had to write that. If, I mean, with the exception of a few pawn structures, there were so many close structures where the computer would saying. Uh, Black was clearly better, and then Glickerich or Sokolov or the ch- chess um, encyclopedia, they would assess it as slightly better for white or clearly better for white. I'm like, I mean, Glickerich and Sokolov, I mean, specialists in this variation can't possibly be this wrong. So clearly it's the computer that has misunderstood the position, and then I had to figure out why are they saying, these uh, specialists, why are they saying it's clearly better for white? And why is the computer saying it's clearly better for black? So sort of having to work my way through the analysis, uh, glean a little bit at at what the computer is saying in case the big guys had missed some tactics or whatever. But most of the time, it was just something structural that the computer could not yet understand. Uh, Because white had a double C pawn and the center was closed and therefore the computer assessed it as clearly better for black. Uh, but it didn't see like the latent opportunities and uh, and and, and uh, what was possible for white long term in twenty or thirty moves. That's uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean that's and it, it still happens. I mean, I wonder if like Alpha Zero or Leela would do better with that now that the... I, I, I'm sure they would. Uh, but at the same time, uh, even when I'm writing, uh, when I uh, was writing my my book here on the English, which is of course very recently, there are positions where the computer just said, "Okay, that's equal." But I know for a fact that that position, White scores like ninety percent in, in that uh, variation, even though the computer says that's equal, and all the variations uh, uh, surrounding that position are equal. But if white can score ninety percent, it's pretty tricky to play black, uh, right. and and it's very easy to go wrong. So um, then it's not actually equal equal anymore. No matter what the computer says, it it the practical chances are clearly on white side. And I mean, you'll see that many times in my books um, where I would write uh, write that the computer says this, but this is what I think, this is why I think so, I mean, uh, with the pieces like this here, uh, this gives white opportunity to do this, or black opportunity to do this, and therefore I would prefer to play white or black in a given position. Uh, And I think uh, that's where uh, chess authors, they have to be very careful and not just rely on the engine, and the same thing with people that are analyzing the openings on their own. Uh, Don't just rely on the computer, I mean, try to understand what the plans are and can you actually defend a position that where the computer says it's equal uh i i remember dubov um uh, daniel dubov he was uh, annotating on one of these big tournaments and uh they switched the engine on for a bit because it was a very complicated position and he's like saying okay yeah the computer says it's equal but this mm-hmm. is a position where black will have to play like 10 only moves in a row that's never going to happen so therefore uh, I mean, the computer is, is is kind enough to tell us that it, uh, that there is a path to equality down the down the line. But uh, in practical terms, this is much better for white. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, again, I mean, we have to be very careful when we're using the engines. They're they're they are amazing in many ways, but they are also uh, uh, a temptress um, uh, to make us think that things are very different from what they actually are in practical chess. Well said. <laughs> um, all right, so Karsten, I have a I have a few more topics. Uh, okay. One one that I want to circle back to, and a couple that we haven't uh, haven't broached yet. So you mentioned that when you were telling the story of how you got into the English and that you were drawn to uh, Victor Korchnoi. So what what was it about him that that 
uh, that made you such a fan right away? Well, it, it, it was his, his personality, the fact that he had left the Soviet Union, I mean, uh, which was no small feat at the time. I mean, it's, uh, and I mean, he had basically finished playing, uh, the tournament in, uh, in Amsterdam in 1976. And rather than attending, uh, uh, this, uh, reception at the Soviet embassy, he decided to, uh, go seek political asylum, uh, and then just him fighting his way back into chess, because uh, I mean he was uh, given a lot fewer playing opportunities because the Soviets wouldn't show up in the tournaments where uh, where he had accepted an invitation, um, and I think with one exception uh, in a Lone Pine tournament where uh, the organizers did not tell the Soviets that he was going to be be taking part. Um, uh, and then they were allowed to play even then. I think it was Romanishin and another player that were allowed to play back then. But other than that, uh, he weren't given access to the same uh, same uh, level tournaments as the Soviets, and therefore didn't have necessarily um, the same opportunities as the uh, the Soviets. And nevertheless, he fought against them all. He beat them all uh, through two candidate cycles and uh, challenged Karpov. And even though he lost both matches, I found him endlessly fascinating. And that's also why uh, when, uh, and this is where uh, Elon Rubin, he, he asked me what, uh, about uh, that uh, my, my favorite book uh, uh, of Sosonko's uh, and that evildoer uh, about... Sosonko's relationship with uh, Korsnoy and that biography on, uh, on Korsnoy is is easily one of my favorite books of 2018. It's, yeah, it's, it's great. It's a phenomenal read, absolutely. I mean, uh, I couldn't put it down. And uh, um, I mean, it was much more invigorating and interesting than the other book that he wrote on Bronstein, which made me thoroughly depressed uh, because uh, Bronstein as a personality shown a completely different light uh, in the book than he had done uh, through his other books that I had read in the past. So uh, that book on Bronstein made me sad. The one on Kortnard made me like, wow, this person, I made a good choice when, yeah. <laughs> when I, I had somebody to model myself after. I mean, there's many bad things that can be said about uh, Kortnard. He said so himself. He was no angel. But he was a very fascinating character and that that appealed to me right from the get-go and, and and i mean it still appealed to me even when uh i i had different favorite chess players over the years i mean uh, one of his arch enemies petrosian is probably my favorite chess player now along with larson so uh <laughs> um, that was going to be my next question okay <laughs> yeah no i mean larson is is somebody i've learned a lot from uh just from studying uh, hundreds of his games over the years uh, and, and I mean there's a book that is not yet out in English and I don't know if, if there are any plans to put it out in English but there's a, a, Jan a Danish uh, chess journalist called uh, Jan Lofbeer that has written volume one on Larsen and it's I think it covers up to 1965 and it is a massive book it's like 750 pages uh, with all his games all his annotations from uh, from I mean, from the fir uh, the first volume was written together with Larson. I mean, or Larson had assisted with uh, game scores and additional comments about the tournaments he had played in, and so on. And then, of course, everything he had written in Danish chess magazines and elsewhere has been pulled into this uh, this book, and it is outrageously good. Uh, but again, it's only available in Danish so far. Uh, and I hope uh, I hope one day it's going to be published in in English as well. I, I hate to tell you this, Karsten, but you, you might be the one that needs to translate it. <laughs> I trust me, I've thought about it, but it's, it, I mean, it, it it is a little intimidating with 750 pages. <laughs> that's going to yeah. be forever, uh, and that's just volume one. So, um, but uh, who knows? Uh, I may do it one day. Um, okay, and, and, and then of course, I mean, Petrosian. I just. I, I find him very fascinating uh, as a as a chess player. I, I just his super solid style, and then just the way he just uh, snuck up on his opponents and just hammered them over the head when they at least expected it. That 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 that's uh, that style really appeals to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, um, okay, and I I I 
had mentioned that I might ask you about this one. So uh, as someone who, who tracks, you know, the opening battles pretty closely, especially with, uh, with the ones that are in your wheelhouse. So are there any sort of, uh, is there any like raging theoretical battle at the top level that you're tracking more closely than anything else in terms of uh, openings? Not terribly, honestly, because I mean, it changes all the time. And I mean, um, uh, I mean, what may be fashionable for a few months uh, is not something that really ultimately appeals to me uh, um, because uh, I will likely never see it myself in a game and yeah and and it is of very little interest to the average player so i i don't really follow trends too much uh i do see the games i do notice them um but uh what i much more appreciate is uh, is a good uh well fought game where uh, there's an interesting uh exchange of ideas and then ultimately an, an, an end game is played out um, and then I mean that that is a game that I find so much more interesting and uh, I, that's where my students often tell me that okay now you've gone off track again I mean I <laughs> started talking about a, an end game in an article that I once read and so on and they're like okay Carsten shut down now <laughs> let's go back to this right. <laughs> because uh, that, that's the part i really enjoy in chess i mean really the battle like uh oh, for example just to go back to the uh the uh, world championship match between carlson and uh, kayakin which was largely uneventful but uh especially the games in the in the playoff where uh carlson was was uh, was very close to winning one but where uh, Kayak and he uh, put up a very tough defense and then constructed a fortress in the end. I mean, stuff like that. I mean, that I just live for that kind of stuff. And then, then or a, a a where once one player has this positional concept that just comes through to fruition and uh, just breaks the defense of uh, of your the opponent. Stuff like that. I I live for that kind of stuff. So um, uh, that I appreciate. And I, I mean, that's also. Uh, part of what I enjoy in in modern chess is uh, not the same amount of dull draws as they used to be. Of course, they still exist, but there's a lot interesting fighting games. And Carlson has definitely done a lot to make that happen by by just saying, you know what? Again, I don't need to play the most fashionable lines. Uh, I can play something that looks utterly ridiculous and still create a battle uh, that's going to be carried on in through the middle game into the end game and I'll, uh, he, he's still able to beat some of the best players in the world with these bizarre openings yeah it's great i mean yeah. i i love it as a chess fan yeah no exactly and i mean the candidate tournament was just a mind-blowing uh event i mean fantastic chess uh i mean that i really thoroughly enjoyed i mean Having to go to work some days when when that was going on, that was a nightmare because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in my lunch breaks, I would be sitting and, and, and uh, frantically going through the games. And, of course, I would be missing the banter online and everything. It was just, that was frustrating. But Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's kind of the go the golden age of chess coverage, I would e exactly. say. Exactly. And, I mean, there, there's... Uh, we're really spoiled as a chess audience nowadays um, by having so many great annotators sitting and explaining it online, seeing how they misunderstand positions, and then all of a sudden it strikes them, holy moly, this is what's happening, or look at that blunder and whatever. And I, I really like the fact that most of these annotators, they don't have the engines on, so you you sort of get their thought process uh, of what the positions are, how you should be approaching them. And I mean, it, you really learn a lot from them. And that's why I wish more of these uh, people that, were, that are sitting and writing comments and uh, online, they would just switch the engines off and try to understand why the players are playing this instead of saying, oh, yeah, the, he missed a, a golden opportunity here with uh, where he could have scored plus three. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. It, it has no importance. Uh, I mean, yeah. it really means nothing uh, in the overall picture because they don't have the engine, and that's to see that would require sometimes a minor miracle. Uh, and, and that's why I like how we are spoiled by having, like, Schwittler and Gustafsson and yeah. uh, Seowon and many others uh, uh, sit and explain to us why certain things are happening and how they evaluate a certain position. I, I think that's fantastic. Uh, yeah. I, and 
Yeah, yeah just as an aside for listeners, I mean, people shouldn't take it for granted. You know, you should you should support the sites that that put out this content. Um, you know, usually it's not too expensive, whether it's a donation model or a subscription model. Uh, you know, it's um it's incredible. So we we want it to last. So we should support it. No, absolutely. And I mean, it, it goes for many things. And chess chess fans are incredibly spoiled and they take a lot of things for granted. Uh, I have myself also taken, th- taken things for granted, but I, I try to uh, to support the things that I think uh, that I think are, are valuable and right. And I mean, you absolutely make a good point. Uh, those uh, websites that are putting out that content, uh, like Chess24 and uh, many other sites, uh, Chess.com and so on, they... Yeah, and like the chess bras, Twitch streaming. Yeah, I mean, there's so exact, much. Yeah, exactly. And also, I mean, uh, uh, just I think it was yesterday or today. I I, I donated money to um, uh, to the week in chess. Uh, yeah, for, well, him most of all. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, for years and years and years, he has put out these uh, downloads. Um, uh, with uh, thousands of games every week. It's an amazing amount of work he puts into them uh, to put these files out for free downloads. And uh, there is thousands of hours of study material in every single download if you really wanted to, uh, rather than just putting them into a database like most people do. I mean, uh, appreciate what you have and then just stop taking everything for granted and support the people that that you, you enjoy. Yeah. Well said. Uh, okay, Karsten, last topic. We've, uh, okay. we, we've, we've covered everything except for your life outside of chess. So, <laughs> okay. so tell us a little bit about your job and, and what you do uh, that's, that's not chess-related. Well, I, I've been in the shipping industry uh, since 92, uh, and that was also completely by, by accident. I, I'd actually come home from a chess tournament in, uh, in Russia. It actually changed from the Soviet Union to Russia while I was in uh, playing the tournament. I was there with Peter Heinen and Nelson and, and uh, uh, another uh, friend of ours, uh, Stefan Peterson, who was an international master. We'd been playing out in the Ural Mountains. We came back to Denmark, and I told my dad, I need a break from chess. I, hmm. I played full-time. I didn't enjoy it anymore. Uh, I need a real job now. So I sent out a bunch of applications. The first one I got called in for an interview for was as an apprentice in the shipping company. And that's basically where I've, I've been working in shipping since many different parts of shipping. Um, but like chess, uh, it's uh, once you have good understanding of shipping, you can work anywhere. Uh, so it's taken me from Den- different places in Denmark, different parts of the industry in Denmark. I've uh, lived in Miami, worked there, lived in London. I also worked in the industry, that, and then it took me to uh, Los Angeles, um, and then uh, now I've been living in the New York area since, uh, in, in New Jersey since uh, 2003, um, and doing different parts, uh, different stuff, but um, currently I'm uh, uh, developing European traffic for a uh, freight forwarder called uh, Emotrans, uh, a German, uh, uh, yeah. it was founded in Germany about 50 years ago, but um uh, a, a great family-owned company, and it's uh, really great people. So, and it, is, it has taken me all over the world uh, in my in my job as well. I mean, I've traveled throughout Europe, South Africa, India, Bangladesh, um, and of course worked in a bunch of places as well. It's uh, a very fascinating industry. So huh. that's that's what I've been doing for since '92, uh, when I've not been writing chess books. So, sounds pretty good. So, <laughs> so if there are any young listeners thinking, "Huh, maybe I should. I'd like to see the world. Maybe I should get into the shipping industry." What should they do? It's not a bad place to be. I mean, again, I mean, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of shipping companies. But again, I mean, if you're willing to work hard and and, and are not afraid of challenges, I mean, the shipping industry is an interesting place to be, and you learn something constantly. And again. Uh, uh, if you're unafraid, then you get opportunities to see different parts of the world, and you can work basically anywhere uh, with with a basic shipping education. So uh, mm. I, I highly recommend it. I, I wouldn't want to do anything else uh, if it wasn't uh, anything to do with chess. chess. So what what should they major in? Let's let's say there's well, an 18. Well, I mean that there's I mean uh, there are some colleges uh, and universities that have uh, logistics degrees and. Uh, and that that's probably the best place to start. Uh, okay. So, I mean, in Europe, they have 
um, a different setup where you go through an apprenticeship for two years or three years, and then uh, you you get a real job after that once you've passed your apprenticeship. And that's that's the route I went in Europe, and uh, where you go through shipping school and so on. But uh, in the U.S. and in many other countries, there's actually lo- logistics degrees that you can take in or international shipping, and uh, that's a good way to go. Okay. Um, and I know that you're married, uh, but between the job and the, the chess writing, do you, do you have time for any other hobbies besides chess? Not many. Uh, I, I used to run a lot. Uh, then I got myself injured. I, I have run a bunch of ha- half marathons. I ran New York marathon a few years ago. Um, so I'm trying to get myself back into, uh, a state where I'm injury free and able to run half marathons. Cause honestly, it gives me a, a release in terms of, uh, I, I think about a lot of stuff while I'm running. I get a lot of ideas. Uh, and when I'm not running, I can just feel that uh, the creative drain, uh, because, uh, when I'm out there on the roads, there's nothing else to interfere. There's no social media, there's no websites, nothing. It's just me and whatever is going on in my head. And that is an amazing thing to do. And honestly, I hated running until I, I made the decision. I have to do something truly remarkable. And then I decided to run a marathon. Wow. And train for it. And at that point, I hadn't run further than three miles, which is you know, five kilometers, uh, when I made that decision. So, uh, and I actually started liking it. For the first time in my life, I actually started enjoying running. Uh, and uh, I have enjoyed it since. It's, uh, yeah, it's an acquired taste. I enjoy it, but I always I always feel like a marathon is a bridge too far. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I would never do that again. I would never run yeah. another marathon, but half marathon... Uh, yeah, I agree. That's doable. Yeah, that's absolutely doable. Almost without training, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. I did two half marathons in one weekend without having trained for it, and that was pushing it a little too far. But I still, I was able to do it. So, um, so yeah, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody else, though. But a half marathon is a good goal to make uh, for yourselves. Okay. Well, Karsten, is there anything else uh, we need we need to discuss before? Um before we uh, call it a night here? No, I don't think so. I, um, I, I think we've covered a lot of things. But again, I mean, I just want to encourage people to, to play chess, enjoy chess, and do it without uh, using the engine for everything. I mean, you, yeah. you really learn so much more about chess than yourself when you do it without a computer telling you what the best move is. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, and your books can be purchased on Amazon and all the other all the other places you mentioned, New and Chess, and yeah, yeah, all the major chess retailers. And if they don't have it, ask for it and tell them to get it. Uh, contact me, then I will make sure that uh, that they get the books in their stores as well. I'm I'm working on getting it uh, to to just about every place. Uh, somebody in, in in Cyprus reached out to me today to uh and uh and wanted to carry my books so um excellent yeah so i mean so i mean who knows i mean and ebooks you can get those downloads those anywhere so i mean uh, uh yeah okay and in terms of reaching you i know you've got a web page and you're on twitter anywhere else i should uh no i mean uh twitter or facebook or uh, on on my web page um uh, i mean uh, winning quickly at chess uh, dot com but i mean yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm I'm easily reachable, uh, and don't be afraid to send me a question. I'll, the most likely thing will be that I'll, I'm going to help you. <laughs> Excellent, sounds good. <laughs> yeah. I, um, okay, well, Karsten, this was fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm very happy to have been part of uh, of the podcast. Special shout out to Geert Vanderveld for supplying the perpetual chess intro music. I also want to thank everyone who supports the podcast. That includes people who tell their friends about the show, people who write a positive review on their podcast platform like Apple Podcasts, but most of all to those who've donated to support the show. I spend a lot of time doing it, probably about five hours a week, and even though I love the work, it can be hard to find the time. So I want to give special thanks to my Patreon and PayPal partners, and this list is getting a little bit long, but that is a great thing. That's what keeps the show going. So, special thanks to... Adam Ralph, Adam Vrancouge, Adrian Gutierrez, Andre Crisdois, Alex Pejas, Brian Mullis, Carl Lebans, Chris Wainscott, Chad Hilton, Christopher Wood, 
Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Chris Flanagan, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer, International Master Elect Donnie Ariel, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Greg Shahadi, Harish Srinivasan, I hope I said that right, Harish, James Banastia, Jennifer Valens, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Jernigan, Jen Shahadi, Jens Green, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, Johnny McMenamin, Katerina Nemkova, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Lorraine Dore, Matthew Passi, Macaulay Peterson, Matthew Tedesco, Nathan Webster, Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahalva, Rob Lazorchek, Robert Steiner, Tatya Babrahamian, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Chachenko, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotella, Victor Vrankul, Zhao Cheng, and Jivko Stoyanov. Thanks, everyone. I'll catch y'all next week. Mm-hmm.